channel open, welcome back to Weekly Trek, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions podcast network and presented in partnership with TrekCore.com. I am your host, Alex Perry. What's today's date? The date. Today's show was recorded on March 12th, 2022, and is current through the Star Trek Picard episode Penance and the Star Trek Discovery episode Species 10C, so beware of spoilers. And if you are in one of the regions where Star Trek Discovery or Star Trek Prodigy has not yet aired and you are trying to stay spoiler-free, be sure to check the episode article on Trek Core for time codes for each of our stories tonight in order to avoid them. All right, let's get into the show. Good day, Voyager, and welcome to... A Briefing with Neelix. It's a catchy title, isn't it? Weekly Trek is a regular news show covering the biggest stories from the Star Trek franchise. We are in a new golden age of Star Trek. There are five television shows in production, possibly more on the way, and enough merchandise to fill the Bajoran wormhole. So stick with me and I'll help you sort the real facts from lots of the Dominion propaganda that you'll find online. But I can't do this alone. And my guest this week is returning guest, Caleb Dorsch. Caleb, welcome back to Weekly Track. Hey, Alex. It's always great to be on Weekly Track. Thank you again for having me. All right, Caleb. Well, you know the drill. I want to know something that's got you excited about Star Trek at the moment. What's got you moving at Warp 10? Um, everything. <laughs> is that an appropriate <laughs> answer? Just getting two episodes of Star Trek each week, both with Picard and Discovery. And uh, then on top of that, getting the Strange New Worlds trailer, which we're going to talk about later today. I've really been enjoying Picard a lot more in season two compared to some of the season one stuff. I still liked a lot of the season one stuff, but everything just feels like it's on the right foot with Picard season two. And the tail end of this Discovery arc, I'm I'm quite satisfied with so far. So I'm very excited to get into that discussion today too. Yeah, it's we're sort of in the middle of a bit of a period of embarrassment of riches, right? I mean, we have two shows on right now. We have one coming in less than two months from when we are talking. We've got this big official convention coming up in just a few weeks now, Star Trek Mission Chicago. We have merchandise. We've got more merchandise today. We've got action figures. You know, it's just, it just feels like this particular couple of months there's the 10 forward experience currently taking place in Los Angeles that like this particular moment in time is one where we are absolutely flush with Star Trek in all kinds of different forms and hey that's pretty great and you know we have one more week of have doing double duty with Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard then it'll be Star Trek Picard alone for a couple of weeks then the season finale and the series premiere of Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Strange New Worlds respectively will premiere on the same day on May 5th and then we're into Strange New Worlds and before you know it the summer has arrived oh yeah and then that means Lower Decks is right around the corner too and then yeah. Prodigy season two or sorry Sorry, Prodigy Season 1, Part 2. And uh, yeah, this is the golden age for sure. <laughs> well, the thing I'm feeling good about Star Trek this week is actually pretty, it's sort of one of the things you mentioned. I am uh, really enjoying where Star Trek Discovery Season 4 is landing for folks who follow me on Twitter and read some of the things that I write on Trek Core. You will know that the sort of back half of the season of Star Trek Discovery Season 4 is one that I have struggled with quite a lot structurally and my issues with it are not fully solved by the way that it's ending. Obviously, we're saying this having seen 12 of the 13 episodes, the season finale airs next week. But I will say, you know, one of the things that I had kind of wanted from very early on as this season's arc started to unfold and it was this species 10c this mysterious kind of who are they what are they and then it turned out they were outside of the galaxy i had kind of really wanted them to lean in hard into species 10c being like very alien and very weird and not being actors with silicone appliances in some way, shape or form. And I have to say, I mean, in that regard, they have really delivered in presenting, and I hope we will learn more about them in the season finale, but just in Rosetta and then and then the episode titled Species 10C, what we have come to understand of this race is really interesting and they are very exciting and they are very alien and they are very weird and they're complete as far as we know completely new to star trek and an entirely new sort of concept for an alien which is also really terrific because you know obviously as a huge longtime star trek fan i go nuts anytime they go back to something that we've seen before but the way to sort of balance out it not just being a nostalgia fest is to 
do something new and try new things. And this is a new thing and I'm really, really liking it. Yeah. And I feel like every iteration of Star Trek needs to have its own thing, right? You had you started with the Borg and TNG and then you had the Dominion and DS9 and then in Voyager, you had several different new races because we were just in the Delta Quadrant. And then in Enterprise, you had the Sphere Builders and it just, this show has been lacking its own thing. Um, I know the the timelines that the show is taking place has been part of its own thing, but in terms of a species that they encounter, you're right. Like they needed their own thing. So I'm really excited about that. I agree with you. The alienness is really, really cool. I actually have some theories I'm still going to talk about at the end of the episode related to this, part of which you've heard before and we'll come back to, but just the, the whole language and, and communication aspect of this past episode with Species 10C. I'm a huge fan of the sci-fi movie Arrival. A lot of people have obviously picked up on that clear homage to that movie. And uh, I think they were able to do enough uh, with this episode that it wasn't a direct copy, but they also were able to integrate some new things with biology and chemistry as well. I'm a science teacher. I teach chemistry. And so for that reason alone, I just really love this Species 10C episode paired with the the alienness, like you said, that uh, they introduced. And the payoff has certainly been worth it, even though the journey from all in to now has been uh a little bumpy, you know, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the way that, you know, this sort of concept that their language is not sort of anything close to our language and the whole episodes kind of arc around unpacking that and how do you communicate and how do you build a common frame of reference with someone where you don't even share many of the same conceptual understandings of the way the universe functions, you know, was just really, really interesting. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited for the, for the season finale next week. And I also have this theory about the season finale. So I guess we're going to, it's going to be a, it's going to be a discovery theory kind of day. So um, we will hold on to that for the end of the episode. And so with that, let's turn to the week's top stories. There's a war going on and I'm a reporter. Well, good news, Star Trek fans eagerly awaiting a trailer for Star Trek Strange New Worlds. The first teaser has finally arrived. After the aborted trailer release a couple of weeks ago when Paramount accidentally leaked a teaser for the upcoming Star Trek show over the public feed at the Paramount Global Investors event in February, an actual teaser for Star Trek Strange New Worlds is finally here, and it is worth the wait. I need you back, Captain. No matter how many stars there are in the sky, no matter how many galaxies swirl beyond our own, no matter what the mathematical probabilities or the number of times we say, we are not alone in the universe. Our first visit from the stars is always the province of children's stories and science fiction. Until one day, it isn't. From those who were able to watch the teaser at the Investor event last month, this was actually a different teaser almost entirely. The first teaser for the show appears to show Pike holed up somewhere on Earth, resistant about a return to Starfleet. The trailer then proceeds to show a number of impressive shots of, yes, you guessed it, Strange New Worlds, which obviously you wouldn't have seen because I just played the audio, with not much focus in this trailer on the show's characters or on the Enterprise itself, where the Investor trailer did have a bit more of shots of the Enterprise characters, particularly the new characters. 
characters, which we didn't really get in this first public one. But that's probably a good thing, helping to set the tone for this show as being about the adventures of the Enterprise and its crew. And with the premiere of Strange New Worlds now only two months away, we won't have long to wait until all is revealed. Caleb, what was your reaction to the first teaser for Star Trek Strange New Worlds? All right. So for those that know a little bit about my Trek uh, background and history, the original series was my first Star Trek. I've been watching it since I was in elementary school uh, with reruns on sci-fi. And I just love, even in the 60s, kind of the way they launched their aesthetic, particularly with like the matte painting backdrops for all of the uh, different planets they went to. And the one thing I picked up on immediately with this trailer is like you said, all these different locales and how beautiful they are, especially now that we have maybe the AR walls being in use or even some other different kind of digital assets that they're able to to bring to the table here and just really bring these worlds to life. And so I think that is going to be part of the updated magic for this show is that it still feels very much like the original series in that sense. So I love, 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 love what we saw. I think one of the things we saw looked like Shakar. Then there were a couple other different worlds too. It just it just screamed the same kind of updated aesthetic that they've tried to introduce in uh, Discovery when they first brought on the the redesigned Enterprise. And uh, man, I'm I'm so ready for this. Even though we didn't get much of a glimpse of the actors other than Pike and uh, Spock, just the design of everything is is really hitting home for me. I, I love the communicator redesign. I love the shuttle redesign. I, I, even the shot that they have of the Enterprise in this trailer uh, reminded me a lot of the art for the book the enterprise war by john jackson miller and i love that book and so it was just really cool to see all those kind of things teased out here and i know it's just a teaser but that's that's the point i think they sufficiently tease exactly what they needed to here yeah it's definitely a tone setting teaser right it's not a we're going to show you everything you, you want to see right like we're really curious about things like well, what does the interior of the enterprise look like I and mean, obviously we have a pretty good sense of what the bridge is going to look like but for the appearance of the Enterprise and Star Trek Discovery season two, you know, when they were doing corridors and quarters and all of that, they were just redressing the Discovery sets. Well, now they shoot on entirely different sets that they built themselves. They picked up the Enterprise bridge and they moved it over to the CBS studio in which they filmed Strange New Worlds up in the Toronto area. But they would have had to have built whole new sets for corridors and quarters and sick bay. And we don't know what any of that stuff looks like, right? I mean, how, you know, how much does it look like a redress of the Star Trek? Discovery sets, how much does it look like a, you know, more like the 60s Enterprise? So we obviously we, we don't have any of that yet, but I think in terms of like setting the tone for the show, this teaser sort of comes out of the gate and says, you know, none of that kind of matters really, right? Like really what matters is, are we telling you interesting episodic stories that grab your attention, keep you engaged, give you something new and different? And I think, you know, obviously there were the familiar flourishes and touches within this trailer, right? The communicator confirming that the one we saw on the desk in Rosetta a couple of weeks ago was borrowed from the set of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. And the, yes, I think you know, we did see Spark. Was he shirtless? Was he wearing a flesh tone bodysuit? Who knows? Standing, you know, sort of on the hills overlooking Shikar. You know, we obviously saw the, the, the Enterprise itself. I mean, we've seen enough of, from the show to know that they've not done much by way of kind of altering the design of the exterior of the Enterprise from what we saw in Star Trek Discovery Season 2. But then really the main focus in this trailer is on some of the places they're going to visit, right? But throughout there is this sort of sense of like, TOSiness that was not present in so much of the build up to Star Trek Discovery, right? They were very much in Discovery at that point in time saying, hey, we're trying to do something different. Yes, it's set at the same time, but it doesn't look the same. Get used to it. You know, things are a bit different. You know, yes, there might be little flourishes here and there, but overall, you know, this is a new look for a new time period time in sort of real life, you know, even though it's sort of a revisiting a time period from the previous shows. And like, you get a bit more of a sense in this one that maybe they are taking a bit of a different approach to Strange New Worlds. I mean, just the the one thing that sort of sticks in my mind is the use of the theremin right at the end of the trailer, right? That iconic 60s instrument that nobody uses anymore, but that is, right. is it was used throughout the original series, was like a main feature on the, in, I think, the motion picture as well. Like that just says very much like, hey, there might be a bit of sort of a retro futuristic, you know, sort of TOS-y vibe going on here. And I'm all for that. Yeah. And even just the backdrop, the, the audio for, uh, that 
very clearly is is Una Chin Riley just kind of discussing the premise of the show, really. And that, I think that's the the beautiful part of it. And I thought that was a really clever way to kind of reintroduce this. Like you said, eventually we are going to see what all the corridors look like. I think uh, we're probably going to get a big trailer around Mission Chicago, um, if not at Mission Chicago, and if we'll see a bunch of those things. But this was this was just enough to get people excited. We have to also acknowledge that uh, there's still some issues with Paramount Plus and this not potentially being readily available to everyone on May 5th. But besides that, I think everyone that has seen this trailer so far, the response I've seen has been pretty positive. And even some theories that uh, the person calling Pike back into the to fold is uh, Robert April, which would be kind of <laughs> kind of an interesting connection. Because yeah. we only saw him in the animated series, yep, right? Correct. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, for how short the teaser was, it really did pack a punch. And I think now that you mention it, to my mind, Guaranteed, I think there's no question Star Trek Mission Chicago is where the like two minute trailer will premiere. And that's the one that's going to have all of those kind of looks at the characters, go inside the ship kind of thing. Because if you can do it in that sort of environment, you're going to develop the necessary buzz, hopefully, that will then persist over the kind of, you know, then three or four weeks before the show itself premieres. I mean, there, you know, it's less than two months away now. So it does feel right that it, we're about a month out from Mission Chicago. And then a month after that, the show premieres that at the two months out point from premiere, you get the teaser trailer at the one month out point, you get the full trailer and then you get the full show beginning May 5th. And so, yeah, I think it's almost guaranteed in my mind that that full trailer is coming at Star Trek Mission Chicago. Cargo. And the part of the reason why they, A, stomped all over the investor event trailer release, and then in this one did not kind of show you kind of fully reveal the cards and the hand about, you know, exactly what this show is and more about the characters is because they are, I think, hoping to land that at a live event where people will be more like, oh my God, what is happening type thing, you know, rather than everybody sort of being in their homes and getting it through Twitter. Right. And one last thing to note is just the current guest lineup at Mission Chicago does not feature any of the big three. So I'm wondering if they're really sitting on the announcement that they're coming to Chicago, or at least some of them are coming to Chicago until the last minute, to kind of build that last second push and hype for what will potentially be this trailer, like you said, for Strange New Worlds. I would not be surprised if we do not get anyone from Strange New Worlds at Mission Chicago. And the only reason I say that is because if this were 2019, I think absolutely they would. And because Toronto's not that far away from Chicago, right? Like, you know, what is it? An hour and a half flight at most. They would kind of stick them on a plane, send them there, have them do the Mission Chicago thing and then stick them on a plane and send them right back again. But given COVID protocols and all of that and the fact they're filming season two right now. What I've sort of been envisioning is there is a Strange New World panel. Everybody goes in, you know, and maybe it's Kurtzman or somebody like that who sort of introduces it. And then and then he goes, I got a message from the captain and you throw up to the big screen and it's Anson Mount and maybe it's Ethan and Rebecca as well on the bridge. And they're like, hey, we're in the middle of filming season two of Star Trek Strange New World. So, and because, you know, we're trying to be as safe as possible, we're really sorry we're not able to be in Chicago with you, but we want to give you the fans something special so we're going to do two things first of all here's the trailer for star trek strange new worlds and they're going to show you the full trailer and then that will get released everywhere that'll be wide release and then they'll say okay and just for you the fans in the room we've got something even more special for you and they play i'm going to say the scene that they showed the tcas the television critics association the one about uhura kind of arriving on the enterprise which was only shown at tca and was not publicly released and then there's sort of that element of kind of like, ooh, the fans in the room get the exclusive, but there's also this wider release that everybody else can enjoy as well at the same time. That's just my guess for how this ultimately plays out. I know nothing about what's planned. I know nothing about what's happening. You know, maybe they are like, eh, COVID's not such a big deal anymore. Let's get the crew down there and let's get them on stage. But if they don't, my guess is that's what happens. I think that's a really solid theory. Well, we're just going to have to see. We're under four weeks. So I'm yeah, excited. right. I'll yeah. be there. Yeah, I'll be Not there long to go. And, and we're going to we're going to be losing our minds together. <laughs>
Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, after 13 months of near continuous production, broken only for the holidays, COVID disruptions, and a very short break between the filming of season two and three, filming on Star Trek Picard season three has now ended. And that's a wrap on season three of Star Trek Picard. As you watch and enjoy season two, just know the next and final chapter in Picard's story is a truly remarkable thing. I am beyond thankful to Terry Metalis, the cast, crew, and all of our extraordinary writers who made it possible, tweeted co-executive producer and co-writer for this week's episode, Penance, Christopher Monfetti. And Seven of Nine actress Jerry Ryan tweeted, quote, and just like that, it's done. That's a series wrap on Star Trek Picard. So surreal since season two has just started airing. I can't wait for you all to see what's coming in season three. Huge love to our incredible cast and crew. What a journey it's been. And matching expectations, it looks like the veil of secrecy around whether Star Trek Picard season three will be the last for the show has now been lifted, with a number of the show's actors and crew confirming the conclusion of season three will be the end of the series. Though, just because Star Trek Picard might be coming to an end with season three, that does not mean a lot of the talented actors, producers, and writers are necessarily done with the Star Trek franchise, and we'll have to hope there are plans for a successor show set in the early 25th century already in the works. Caleb, how are you liking Star Trek Picard season two so far, and how are you feeling now we know that season three will be the end of Star Trek Picard? I am loving season two so far. I think the Stargazer is probably my favorite premiere of the current era for a season premiere. I think it just had a little bit of everything. It had this great character piece with Picard and all the other characters really each got their own little moment to shine. You had all these great callbacks to previous parts of the franchise that were kind of lacking in season one. And then you just end with Q, right? And then pick right back up in Penance. And oh my gosh, that first 15 minutes of Penance, just Picard and Q, you know, John Delancey just chewed that up with Patrick Stewart. And it was amazing. I I actually, I tweeted because I saw the... Um, first two episodes at the virtual premiere event the the day before the first episode premiered. And I tweeted after that I was shaking after uh, the second episode and and I rewatched it again yesterday and same, I'm just humming. I mean, it's just so, so awesome what they're able to do so far. And I'm really excited to see where it goes. Uh, I know it's looks like a little bit of a darker spin right now. Um, Penance was definitely a uh, pretty dark turn and setup. But I know we're going to get this time travel element soon and we're going back to 2024. At least that's what it looks like. And I'm really, really excited to see how it unfolds. As for season three, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. I think it makes sense, right? You know, Sir, uh, Sir Patrick Stewart's not getting any younger. He's probably got just about all in the tank that he, he can with uh, these three seasons. And honestly, I favor it that way. I would much rather the show come to a natural end that was planned out from the start than for something to happen and they not finish the show or they have a major loss in the middle of the show. And, you know, not that, you know, everyone kind of, it's like the elephant in the room and no one wants to talk about it, but that is a, certainly a possibility have had they continued the show past three seasons. And uh, so it's just, it's good that it's going to be a finished com- and complete told story. It's awesome that it seems like they're setting up the characters to have, you know, story afterwards. I'm, I'm really excited to see if we do get a successor show and what it will be. All right. I, I love Elnor. I love Seven. And I love uh, Rafi and Rios. And Girati has been a little, little weird <laughs> this entire time. And I think that's still the, the same cup of tea we're drinking from with her in season two. But I I think the humor that she's providing, I think, is working a lot better than in season one. And so, yeah, I'm just excited to see where this all unfolds. I think I remember hearing something in an interview. Actually, maybe we're talking about that interview a little bit later with John Delancey. So I'll I'll hold that part later. But just about what to expect with the rest of season two and then even parts of season three. So there is a ton to look forward to here. Yeah, I mean, they certainly do seem to be right. Like, you know, obviously we're we're two episodes into season two having a great time eight episodes of season two left but there is this sort of rumbling on the horizon of like oh boy you are not ready for season three style and and because we are so far away from it from a story perspective it is completely impossible at this point to even begin to visualize what season three is about what it will look like and who it will include right i mean there there have been you know and i've talked about this in previous episodes as part of my theories right some of these kind of little hints that have been dropped that like you know maybe there are some big names coming is it the rest of the tng cast is it 
Is it other people maybe who, you know, have kind of had past affiliations with the Star Trek franchise? I think the, the more hints people drop, the more I'm like, well, I actually think it could be anybody. And that, you know, that just this sort of growing sense that like season three, yes, is going to be the end of Star Trek Picard and it's going to be sort of, you know, what an end they will make of it style, right? Like really big, really kind of expansive you know, sort of tied into whatever the story is they're kind of starting right now that will then run through the two seasons. And clearly from this past episode, right, like there's something going on with Q and, you know, what what frighten, what could possibly frighten Q or what could possibly make Q sick or, you know, sort of whatever is going on there is clearly a big deal and a big problem and something that, you know, ultimately needs to be addressed. And maybe that will be sort of the story of over the course of season two and three of this show so yeah I mean really exciting that we basically have this like you know they filmed it this way they wrote it this way what feels to me like a 20 episode story now I don't I don't know for sure that that's a, that's absolutely the case and that two and three won't sort of feel distinctively different from themselves in some way shape or form but it does feel like some of the stuff they're setting up now is gonna sort of go through the end of the show and that's you know that's that's clearly very very exciting and yeah I you know I, I think we've We've all sort of been prepped for this to be a three season show. It is a three season show. And so I think the question, you know, by the time we get to this time next year, when hopefully we'll be, you know, two episodes into or more into Star Trek Picard season three is sort of that question of like, okay, is, is something going to come next? Because I, while, I, while I'm really excited for this to be a big bombastic finish to Star Trek Picard, I hope it's not a big bombastic finish to this period of time in the Star Trek franchise and that this will sort of close the books on the 24th century and we'll spend our time elsewhere because I really like the 24th century as my favorite time period in Star Trek and you know and, and, and clearly lots of other people like it too because of the reaction that Star Trek Picard season two has been getting so far and now we're officially in the 25th because I think we're in 2401 right? that's right 25th century baby the future is now all right I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I want it. I'm ready for it. Bring on more. I, I think some of these characters they've been able to introduce alongside Picard have been really, really impressive. Rios in particular is one of my favorites. Uh, and, and going all the way back to Broken Pieces and even the Rios novel that we got uh, last summer, uh, Rogue Elements, I just... I want to see more and more of these characters and 20 episodes almost does not feel enough <laughs> for me to, to be satisfied with all we could possibly learn about these characters, even after we've left Picard and closed the book on him. So yeah, I'm excited. It's going to be good. Well, even though Q was reintroduced in last week's Picard season premiere, The Stargazer, it was not until this week's penance that we got a lengthy back and forth between Picard and Q, reuniting Sir Patrick Stewart and John Delancey for the first time on screen to trade barbs since All Good Things. Stewart Delancey Nancy did an interview with Sci-Fi about the experience of working together again after so much time, and about that shocking moment in which Q slaps Picard, Delancey had this to say, quote, The slap was added at the last moment, and it just goes to show how willing everybody was to take ideas and to run with them, which makes for an environment where you feel supported and encouraged to go to areas and extremes that you wouldn't normally. And hinting at the wider motivation for Q this season, Delancey also went on to say, quote, There's a lot at stake for Picard, and there's a lot at stake for me. In a way, we are both talking about mortality from our different perspectives. And what was it like acting against Sir Patrick Stewart again? I have to say I was a little nervous and trepidatious as to whether this was going to work, Delancey confessed. But then we did the first scene and showrunner Terry Metalis was there and they yelled cut and Terry went, yes, I can see the chemistry. So I figured, well, that we must be in the zone. Caleb, obviously we've been talking a little bit about how much we enjoyed the Picard cue scenes from this week's episode, but like, what was, you, you know, obviously this is a little bit of a different cue. So what was your reaction to seeing the more dangerous dangerous cue on Star Trek Picard. So I, I know you are a very, very big Q fan. I confess that the the lighter aspects of Q were not always my favorite. Well, and Caleb, so it's me... been terrific having you on Weekly Trek. <laughs> Thanks so much. We'll uh, we'll see you next time. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead. I know, I know, I know. So <laughs> that said, the dangerous Q is what I love the most about Q. So this was exactly what I wanted. And actually bringing in uh, his interview also from John Delancey's interview from the Ready Room as well. Yes. He just described how awesome it was to step onto this set, to step into the chateau. And he's like, the 
the way the set is set up, it does the acting for you is what he said. And I was like, I don't know. After watching that, they both still provide yeah, <laughs> really right. amazing things. I'm like, are you sure it's just the scenery that's doing all the work for you? Because <laughs> man, like, but so the the just even breaking it down, like I think it was either right before the slap or whatever. He's talking to Picard. They're you know overlooking the the vineyard, and he like turns his head slightly and just kind of gets this blank stare on his face. And I'm like, this is a very damaged cue and. I don't know what's coming next. And that part, that moment, it was all just body language. And it was just great. Uh, John Delancey still got it. And he, I know he was talking about being nervous, stepping back into Cuba. He really, really is hitting it home. Um, the other thing he said in that interview as well is that he is a catalyst for a lot of the things that we're going to see. And that makes me wonder, right, in season three, does he have a more direct role, whereas here he's kind of springing things into motion. So I think you're right. It is more of a 20 episode thing spread across two seasons and, and it'll be very interesting to see the rest of it. I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, John Delancey man has not skipped a single beat in the nearly 30 years since the last time he played Q, right? Cause even though it's been 20 years since next generation, the Next Generation cast did their final movie. He was last acting against Sir Patrick Stewart as Q in All Good Things in 1994. His last appearance as Q was in 2000 in the Voyager last season. But still, that's 22 episodes, 22 years since you played the character, nearly 30 years since you played the character matching wits against Sir Patrick Stewart. And it's really interesting, right? Like, Obviously, Sir Patrick Stewart has aged quite a lot in the period of time since Star Trek Nemesis. And as a result, his performance, appropriately, I think, given the passage of 20 years worth of time, feels quite different, right? His voice is a bit different. His delivery is a bit different in terms of just like who he is. And I, I think some fans have struggled with that. I mean, I would say again, you know, 20 years have passed. 20 years from now, will you be the same man you are today? Will you sound the same? Will you talk the same way? Probably not, right? But for Q... For this character who is sort of in this kind of scenario where, yes, he's an, um, you know, he's an omnipotent being, right? For him, time has not really passed. And so for John to like jump right into it and for it to be as if no time has passed at all, I mean, aside from, you know, sort of this other stuff that's been going on, which will be revealed later, but in terms of the essence and the delivery and the whole sort of cueiness of it has not lost a beat. And I said this on Twitter. I mean, the man has still got the best finger snap in the game, right? Like, you know, <laughs> also at the, I think he, he's in his 70s now has not skipped a beat on the old finger snap and i won't hear from anybody that that was <laughs> enhanced in post because that is the classic cue finger snap going all the way back to encounter at far point so yeah i mean I, I, like i could rewatch this, this week's episode over and over again just for that opening 10 15 minute kind of repartee between q and picard i love the slap because it was so it was so out of left field it was so dangerous and it was so like oh there really is something more going on here than just i'm here to test you and the game will continue to Type thing right like it sort of brought an, a moment of kind of like oh oh this is actually this is actually kind of scary in a way right in a way that q has not really been scary i would say probably since q who i think was the last time i would say he was a really scary character so yeah i mean i, I loved everything about it and you know everyone knows q is one of my favorite characters and the q picard stuff is one of my favorite things in star trek so to get more of that terrific and i'm i'm really looking forward to more of that throughout the season yeah and, and you know on your point about sir patrick stewart being older and and different line deliveries and every, everything like that you know the part of the thing that i think a lot of people did not expect or were not really fans of in season one was this meager broken man that used to be so great that's kind of the presentation they delivered and i think just being across from john delancey again right the slap was so visceral but just the entire interaction, I think it brought out this like strength, but also this anger. And it just, and it was actually probably the best performance Patrick Stewart has given as Picard in this current series. And for me, that's when I was like, yes, Picard is back. He's here. He's ready to dive into this, you know, and, and he's a very different Picard from even what we saw in season one. And it, all it took was Q to bring that out of him. And I think that makes total sense in the context of their respective characters. So I'm ready, man. 
man. It's going to be great. And lastly this week, one six-scale Star Trek action figure company, XO6, have announced their first product for 2022, which is actually something they teased in 2021 to accompany the release of the Captain Picard and Lieutenant Commander Data first contact figures. You can now pre-order the Enterprise E Captain's Chair scaled for the Jean-Luc Picard figure and will soon be able to order a cardboard diorama backdrop to be able to enhance the display of your XO6 figures. The Enterprise E Captain's Chair is no small or insignificant thing. The chair features light-up control panels on both arms, the base of the chair lights up like the original set piece, and it's programmed with an appropriate series of sound effects and voice clips from the Next Generation movies. The Enterprise E Captain's Chair is available for pre-order on xo-6.com right now through April 5th, 2022, and will cost $195 with $25 in shipping costs. The cardboard backdrop is expected to be more affordable. Not quite sure when that will go up for pre-order. They just say it will be soon. They project that will cost only $15. Caleb, now they've made the Enterprise E Captain's Chair, and obviously, you know, this is not something that most people are going to order. I certainly have ordered it. There's, you know, if this is something you're into, by all means, go for it. If you've got the money for it, more importantly, by all means, go for it. So I'm not going to ask if you want to buy it because you know that's totally up to you but if x06 could make any captain's chair or set design piece from the star trek franchise and they would send you one for free what would you want them to make i'm gonna be honest the 1701 e sovereign class is my favorite enterprise so seeing this chair filled me with so much joy uh, <laughs> if i could af- if i could afford it i would take this uh in a heartbeat and it, you know it's, it's one of those things that now that it's out to it if I were going to collect these, it almost makes me regret not picking up Picard's figure when it first came out. You know, I'm sure I could go through Big Bad Toy Store or some of the other um, third party vendors. But yeah, no, it looks great. It looks uh, just as perfect as it could be. I mean, you can compare it to in the article. There's some of the, the photos from um, I assume it's either Nemesis or, or Insurrection or even First Contact. Well, I'm not sure which frame it's from, but the chair is spot on. The lights are really cool. That's kind of a nice added feature. I, you know, the only thing I want at this point is a whole like sovereign class bridge, right? You know, yeah, right. Uh, that would be I mean, at X06's price point, a uh, one six scale sovereign class bridge would probably run everyone five hundred dollars or more. And so I think we'll quite get that more like five thousand i would imagine yeah this is a this is a nice start um this is really really cool so i i would love this if uh if it was something i had the the money for for sure yeah i mean folks know i am privileged to be able to be in a position to afford some of these so i bought everyone they've released and i pre-ordered this one too within five minutes of it going up online um my captain picard's gonna look great sitting in that captain's chair and is gonna look great in front of the backdrop on display i think that's a really right like i I like figures and stuff for the display value i like to display this stuff i like it to look nice up on display take them out of the box you know get them in poses get them doing stuff i sort of for anybody who ever has the opportunity to come in my office, you know, it's bookshelves and, you know, I sort of break up the books with these little kind of dioramas of, you know, action figures and busts and whatever the hell, Bolger, Chateau Picard, you name it. And so it's really attractive to me personally that they're doing this because it creates this so much more dynamic displays for these figures. I will say that, that so they, when uh, the, the XO6, obviously they people who set up XO6 were originally at QMX and they were doing one six Star Trek figures there and they did most of the TOS and they did Captain Picard from TNG. They did a TOS captain's chair then, which I bought over the holidays because... You know, I'd ordered the Mirror Spark and I was like, oh, I could put the Mirror Spark in the TOS captain's chair. And there was one on eBay and it was, you know, not super, super expensive. So I picked it up and that's also a really nice piece. And so you know, having the TOS chair and having the Enterprise E chair, you know, it's a nice little collection they've got going on. And I, I hope it does well for them and that they ultimately produce more of these. I actually would really like, you know, since we've gotten Janeway and the Doctor, I would love for some for them to figure out some way of doing Janeway's captain's chair, which obviously a little more difficult because it sort of sits on that bench with the XO chair and it's not kind of a standalone uh, but I'm sure there's some way they could figure out how to get it done so um, yeah this this is great I'm really excited for this it sounds like you know, XO6 has sort of been teasing they have big plans for 2022 and a lot more figures on the way so my wallet is already crying out in pain at me but I'm fully in on this and uh, not sure I'm jumping off the train anytime soon so uh, yeah this is another and and I hear also that they will be present at Star Trek Mission Chicago so, so hopefully they'll have things to 
to kind of show off when we get there, which would be really nice. Yeah. And it looks like as of this week, a lot of the doctor pre-orders have started to arrive. And that figure actually looks a lot better than I thought it would after it first dropped. Some of the initial photos that they had, uh, I was like, eh, it kind of looks like the doctor. It's decent. It's nice. It is the doctor. We haven't had a doctor figure like that. And I was like, eh, I'm not going to get it ultimately because I wasn't super impressed with it. But now seeing some of the pictures, it looks a lot better um, in person than than what I was expecting. So yeah, they've got a great line here. And I, I, you know, if they do a Cisco, I'm definitely going to consider it heavily because uh, that's one I definitely would love. And I know eventually they're going to do, I think uh, they said Saru and Burnham. Yep. Uh, I'm a huge Discovery fan. And so I think those ones may call my name. So I might dabble a little bit, but those would be, uh, you know, the, very few and far between for me, but it, it is a very impressive line. And with the doctor too, they could even do is like the bio bed they could do you know a bunch of little different set pieces that would be really cool and just really expand their their horizons there so it's good stuff all right well we've talked about the facts and now let's speculate on what's going to happen in the future of star trek you make some very good points captain but it's still all speculation and theory so each week, my guest and I give you a wish or theory we're nurturing about any of the shows or the future of the franchise. So Caleb, let's hear your theory or wish for this week. All right. As I mentioned, it's going to be a discovery theory, and it's it's actually leaning heavily on something that was tweeted by the actress that plays President Relic. The other, the other day, she tweeted that uh, there are a lot of surprises in store, and we don't even know what's coming. And this was before Species 10C aired uh, this current episode. And I think there were a lot of surprising things right in this this episode. But to tweet something like that, it kind of made me feel like there was something more significant happening, at least in this finale. And so my theory has been shared here on, on Weekly Trek before about the Species 10C being the Kaliar or a Kaliar equivalent from the Destiny trilogy. And even though we got a really, really alien look uh, this week with Species 10C, part of me thinks that what we saw this week is a proxy and that we are still going to see a version or an adaptation of a Kaliar-like species. The fact that they looked at the Boronite as a gift, and then they were able to take Burnham and Saru and Rillick and, and kind of start the discussion this week, only to send them back immediately once there was a slight air of deception with the jettisoning of Tarka um, and Book's ship and kind of leaving the, the whatever the hypersphere that they're in. For me, I think, you know, going off the Destiny trilogy, one of the big things that happens, and spoilers you might want to avoid if you've never read the Destiny trilogy, but there are three planets <laughs> involved with the Kaliar. I think Mantellus is one of them. I forget the other two names, uh, Aragal and, and one other. Um, and anyway, a event happens in uh, this trilogy in which they are deceived, they come under attack, there's a catastrophic breach and explosion. One of the planets is, I believe, destroyed completely. One of them is sent back, you know, 6,000 years in the future or in, in the past. And then the other one is sent laterally into a different part of space uh, in order to save and maintain their existence. And so I still think that's going to be the big surprise. I think Tarka is actually going to succeed next week. And the reason that's significant is because the planet that went all the way back in time was revealed to be the beginning of the Borg. There were Kaliar that were there on that planet. And once they stopped having power from their Omega molecules that powered their entire planet, their nanoprobes kind of went wild, reprogrammed themselves because it became a survival thing, a hunger thing. And it started the Borg. And I think we're about to get a Borg origin story. And I think that's the big reveal that's coming next week. Very exciting. Could be. I mean, you know, I'm a huge fan of the Destiny trilogy. And I think that would still tie in very well to this season of Star Trek Discovery. I guess this is a good point for me to kind of tie in my theory too, which is I think this season is going to end on a cliffhanger. So I think people should start preparing themselves for this season to end on a cliffhanger. Just because 
it's been two seasons since we got a cliffhanger on Star Trek Discovery, right? Season three was not a cliffhanger. It, you know, sort of wrapped up the story very well. Season two, honestly, was not really a cliffhanger either, right? I mean, yes, Discovery went into the far future, but the season did not end on a cliffhanger. It ended on the eighth signal and the Enterprise, you know, warping off to the future, aka its future in terms of its next mission and Discovery being in the future and the expectation being, you know, we weren't going to find out where they had ended up until season three. You really have to wind the clock all the way back to season one of Star Trek Discovery when you got a classic cliffhanger for this show, which was they wrapped up the the Klingon war story and then the Enterprise arrives and appears and everyone's like, oh my God, it's the Enterprise. And then it's to be continued. So we've not had a cliffhanger in a really long time. And I think it just might be time. And I think they might be thinking it's time potentially to set up a little bit of a cliffhanger between season four and season five of Discovery. So whatever happens next Next week. I'm not sure that like the Species 10C story will end on a cliffhanger. I think it'll be one of sort of fairly similar to season one, right? You kind of wrap up the main story. Maybe there's a few kind of things that sort of sort of spill over or there's a something and then it's sort of a cliffhanger, more like a teaser for season five rather than being a, a cliffhanger like, you know, Picard has been assimilated. I have no idea how the story ends. So that's my theory. I'm thinking Discovery season four is going to end on a cliffhanger and hey, maybe the cliff Hanger is, you know, something to do with the theory that you have, uh, Caleb, about uh, the Kaliar and the uh, and the potential origin of the Borg, and we still don't know the origin of the Borg, and that'll be pretty interesting and fun for it to, you know, come from Star Trek Discovery. But yeah, cliffhanger. Would you are you prepared for a cliffhanger if one arrives? I, I am absolutely prepared for a, a cliffhanger. I think you know something that could happen too if this theory is correct, and the planets all end up in different places. You know. We also are wondering, like, how did Zora end up in that nebula back in Calypso, right? Like, they could have some weird thing where a copy of Discovery gets flung, you know, back to wherever, you know, Zora is in that nebula. And then, but it's just the ship without the crew. The main crew could be laterally moved somewhere to safety. And then, you know, Tarka ends up going back in time with this this other planet and gets caught up and ultimately becomes the the first Borg. (laughs) And that was kind of wild, but that's just, it's just so... I don't know. It, there are too many coincidences for for me from what I know of those books and having read them multiple times to to really put those theories to rest yet. And so it's possible. And you know, I could be completely wrong. It could be something completely different. But I think too, we're at a point, right? Season four to going into season five. I, we don't know if there's going to be more than five seasons, but there certainly is a possibility if this is still you know their flagship show that they're leaning on with Picard ending soon. So you know, I think that definitely leads itself up into a longer month multi-season arc. I would love for Discovery to have its own Dominion or something uh, analogous to that. And I think that would be a really, really great uh, move for the show. So yeah, I am all in for a cliffhanger. Bring it on. Well, and Tarka sucks. So like if he ends up being the first Borg, you know, no, there'll be no great loss to the uh, to the universe as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> right. <laughs> Kind of fitting for well, and that was the thing too. Is in the Destiny trilogy, the crew of Makos that were the bring on bringers of this destruction were the first Borg as well. And so it's it's you know just kind of fitting that some t- pretty terrible people get their just desserts in a way, and that's ultimately what spawns this. And for him to be a character that seems so hungry on his own to get to a different kind of life or a different world or diff- just to not even redeem himself, but his whole thing, his whole motivating factor this whole time has been to get to Oros or find Oros and get to this other world to get away from where he currently is at. And for all of that to backfire, I think just seems kind of on the nose for what I'd expect for that character. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think I'm definitely going to watch the finale first and then I'll watch Picard episode three next week. Um, That's the only downside to having this overlap is that uh, we have to pick and choose which we got to watch next, but I'm very, very much looking forward to this finale. So I'm ready. Let's go. Do you have a theory or a wish for Discovery, Picard, Strange New Worlds, Lower Decks, or Prodigy that you'd like to share? Tweet them to me at Weekly Trek or email them to me at Weekly Trek at the tricordertransmissions.com and I might feature your theory in a future episode. Well, that's all the time we've got for this episode of Weekly Trek. Thank you so much to my guest, Caleb Dorsch, for joining me today. Caleb, how can people contact you if they want to continue the conversation? All right. People can contact me on Twitter at Rogue Moog, R O G U E M O G H. I also have uh, some news to share. I've been on a couple of different podcasts recently and coming very soon, I believe this week. 
week, uh, I was on an episode of I Quit Star Trek, uh, in which I discussed Friday's Child with Jack and Genevieve. Uh, so that's coming soon. And I'm also in the early stages right now of actually developing my own Star Trek podcast, which Ooh, is some exciting. cool news I'd love to share. Yeah. Uh, so I'm in the early stages. I have the idea all fleshed out. I've been uh, talking about it with a couple of friends. Um, Bill Mann actually has been really uh, supportive in helping me flesh out some of these ideas. Uh, and so I'm hoping to start uh, recording in the next couple of weeks. I'm waiting on some art and stuff before I formally announce. But I, if it's okay, I do have a title I can officially share. I, I think. mean, give us uh, a scoop, then, Caleb. Tell us what it is. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the rundown. All right. So... <laughs> <laughs> I I have a former movie theater employee before I was a teacher. And so, you know, the Academy Awards shows have always been a big time for me. I love all of the different nominees and things like that. And so my podcast is called Starfleet Academy Awards. Uh, and it basically is going to be a Kurtzman era focused podcast in we, which we review each episode with a panel, kind of like a roundtable discussion. We've got a couple of different awards that we're going to nominate for. Each get to pick kind of our best things from each episode, you know, favorite quote, music musical piece, production design element, character moment, you know, things like that. So we've got a couple of different awards there. And then part of the cool thing, I love interacting with people on Twitter. So there will be a Twitter account. And after each nominee, I plan on putting out polls where people can vote on the nominees from each episode. And then we can talk about the winners in each subsequent episode and keep on moving on. So I think we're far enough away from the beginning of this era where we're now, you know, just over five years from when Discovery first aired. So I think it's a good time to start really diving into some of those episodes that we, you know, got back in 2017. And then if I follow kind of like a biweekly or a monthly pace, I'm not sure exactly what pace yet, but there's plenty to talk about from, you know, 50 plus episodes at this point of Discovery and Picard and Lower Decks and Prodigy. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So Alex, of course, you are invited on at any point. You've got a particular episode you'd love to discuss, but I'm very excited to get the ball rolling on this project. Well, that is exciting. I'm very much looking forward to it. It sounds like a great concept and I can't wait to listen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, it's going to be a good time. And, you know, I've, I've made a lot of friends through through Twitter and through podcasting. And so uh, the door is open for all of our, our Star Trek podcasting friends, for sure. It's going to be a good time. Well, I am looking forward to it. And you can find this show on Twitter at Weekly Trek and me at Alexander C. Perry. And if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast player of choice. And please check out some of the other great shows on the Tricorder Transmissions. And if you like our shows, please also consider becoming a Patreon of Tricorder, which you can find at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. And lastly, if you're looking for Star Trek news on the internet, I hope you will turn to trekcore.com. Well, thank you, Caleb. Thank you to all of my listeners. And until next week, live long and prosper. 